So we've put a bunch of pieces together and we have a pretty good idea, hopefully, of how these pieces interact. We'll use them to start to uh, actually execute some instructions pretty soon. But first, we need a couple of more things. We need to get information into the register file and we need to take the results that are in the register file and present them to the outside world somehow. And so what we need is some information, some way to get the contents of the register file. Where does that data come from? And we need to load and store a few new values. So what we need is actually another piece of memory, very much like the instruction memory we built to look up the instructions. We need data memory to look up the data. And this is going to be another sort of theme in CPU design is the separation of instruction and data. Instruction information is a collection of ones and zeros that tells the machine what to do. And the data memory is the actual contents of information that we're processing. When we are adding up numbers in an array, the data memory is the, is the array itself. And the instruction memory is the list of things to do to look at where we are in the array, what information we're adding at this particular moment, are we done, all that kind of stuff is in the instruction side of things. But we're going to need to add some data memory to our computer, so let's look at how that works. The question is sometimes asked, why do we need data memory? Why don't we just need, put a whole bunch of registers and store everything in registers? Well, in the early days of computing, that's what we did. Uh, but as is sort of typical in the history of computing, some things become faster, quicker than others. And it turns out that memory, it's difficult to make fast. And so memory was slowing down the operation of all of the computing that was done. And so what they did is they made a small amount of very fast memory, which is registers, which you can make. You can make fast registers, but they're incredibly expensive and they take up a lot of space on the chip. So they made this a small amount of registers just for the sort of current working memory. And then they made a larger amount of slower memory uh, that was cheaper to produce. And in fact, there's an entire hierarchy of memory and how expensive it is is directly related to how large it is is directly related to how fast it is. Registers are incredibly expensive, incredibly fast, and very small in terms of the amount of memory relative to the amount of memory a computer can store. Uh, if you wanted to build a computer that was just registers, I think I would have to do the math on this, but it's something like millions and millions of dollars just for the uh, few gigabytes of memory uh, in terms of building one with registers instead of with classic RAM. So we can't really build a computer that's just registers. We have to have a small number of registers, address them using instructions, and then we have this other process of bringing information into a particular register from memory and putting a result from memory back out into, sorry, a result from a register back out into memory. We need to be able to move information back and forth between the register file and memory. We need to be able to tell the machine where in memory we're interested in putting things. Just like the program counter stored the address of the next instruction, the memory address is going to store the address of the, the data that we're interested in. There's a lot of different ways to do this. A very common and simple way to do this is to have a single register that stores the address of the memory. MIPS doesn't do this. One of the design principles of MIPS is to make everything happen in a single clock cycle. So we want to have the whole machine operate everything in a single clock cycle, which means we need to be able to create a memory address that we use to look up information from memory, from data memory, all in the same process as we would in everything else. So we're actually going to store memory address information in the instruction itself. And we're going to calculate, as, we, as we'll see, there's a lot of interesting and complicated ways to calculate memory addresses. And we're going to calculate memory addresses using the same ALU that we've already used to calculate mathematical results. Uh, if we want to, for example, look up somewhere in an array, we want to start at the top of the array and then add some number down. That's a mathematical process, and that's what we're going to use. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the ALU to produce the address for the data memory. And it looks like this. So this ALU now has two possibilities. In fact, it does the same thing. So we, we have two ways to interpret, let's say, the result from the ALU. We can interpret the result from the ALU as the uh, result of an arithmetic operation that we want to store in the register file, or we can interpret the ALU, the result of the ALU, as an address 
in the data memory. And then we can look up some value in the data memory at that address and present that result back to a register file. So here we go. Let's have a look at this. So the ALU result can either bypass the data memory or it can be used to look up some value in the data memory. Now, what does that ALU address look like? Well, we'll look at that in a little while. But basically, the idea is we can calculate some address that's going to be where in memory the data we're interested in is located. And we can provide that calculated address to data memory, look up the data in data memory, and provide the result of that lookup back to the register file. Or we can bypass the data memory use the result of the ALU operation and store that straight back in the register file. Two options, and again, depending on what instruction we calculate, um, one or the other of those options is going to be useful. So that's now three, uh, two things that it can do. We can do arithmetic operations and logic operations, and we can load and store information to and from memory. Now, we can't store it yet. We can just load it. We can look up information from memory and bring it into the register file. Later on, we'll look at how to store information. So the ALU is now going to be used in one of two ways. We can either use it to calculate an address for a data, or we can use it to calculate a result that we store in the register file. Right. So this, the results RD now can come from either the ALU or from the output of data. And so we need a multiplexer there to make that choice. And this is, again, going to be a theme of the construction of these complicated uh, central processing units, these complicated data paths, we call them, is that we're going to create a bunch of things we could do and then use multiplexers to choose which of those things we're actually going to do. And then what's going to happen is the control logic from that multiplexer is going to come from the instruction. The instruction contains all that information. There's no magic here. We have sources for all the information we're doing. Each one of these boxes we can create and if you are looking at this and ever wondering where something comes from, you should be able to point at it and say, that's where it comes from. The selection for this multiplexer comes from the instruction, specifically comes from the opcode, because if the opcode says, add these numbers together, then we're using the ALU output. If the opcode says, look up this number of memory, then we're using the data memory output. And so the opcode is gonna tell us directly whether that multiplexer should choose option A or option B. And so that multiplexer selection process is going to be very common again during the design of these machines. All the information dictating the ALU function, multiplexer selections, register file choices, every selection, every bit of control on every piece of hardware in this computer is stored in the instruction or can be inferred from the instruction. The instruction contains an opcode. That opcode tells every single piece of information, every single piece of hardware, what to do. Now, so far this design has been generic, but I want to look at, again, I've sort of hinted at this, the MIPS instruction system that we're going to be using. MIPS is a short form for microprocessor without interlocking pipeline stages. And that's another way of saying we want this whole thing to complete in a single cycle. It's a very popular embedded processor for things like, I mean, it has been used in computers. There are like a uh, video game, there are some handheld portable video game consoles. Oh yeah, right, it's even here. The PlayStation Portable, PS2, uh, Nintendo 64, all used MIPS as their central um, processing unit. Um, uh, voice over internet boxes, uh, wireless routers, digital cameras, printers, many of these sort of embedded peripheral devices also use the MIPS computer. So it's not without, it's not outside of the realm of reality to learn how this thing works. This is the complete hardware for the MIPS architecture. Uh, and you can already see, this is a drawing from a different book, but you can get a feeling already for some of the commonalities. Here's the register file that we put down. Here's the uh, program counter and the instruction cache. They call it a cache instead of memory, but it's the same thing. Here's an arithmetic logic unit. There's another multiplexer here for some reason, which we'll learn about later. Here's the data memory. Again, they called it cache, but it's the same thing. And a multiplexer to choose from the output of the data memory or the output of the um, ALU. There's a few other things going on and a bunch of control logic um, that we haven't looked at yet. 
<laughs> now I've just made this slide a complete mess. Uh, but there's a few things we haven't looked at yet, but we will look at those as we go and we will create and understand and interpret the entire working data path. Um, this is the Britain version of this same architecture. This is the, the picture that's on the front of the uh, Robert Britton textbook, which has all of the MIPS assembly language in it, uh, which again, yeah, it's all right. Uh, but this is the one that I like because this is the one that I built. So this is one, the one we're going to use. Uh, this is a complete specification of the data path. Don't worry if you don't understand it yet. Each individual piece uh, makes sense in context, and we will walk through every single piece as we look at the full specification of the assembly language for MIPS that's going to execute on this hardware.